the great master Padmasambhava said, the main task we have in this life is that he is the actual author of the Tibetan Book of the Dead and also the Pardo teachings were teaching on life and death, of which the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying is a, a part of that teaching. And he said, the main advice he has for this life, he said, is what is the main task of the life is to work with the mind and purify our perception. Purify perception. And realize the essence, nature, and compassion of mind. But trouble is that we think our perception is reality. But our perception is distorted, conditioned by so many past influences, such as our childhood, culture, experiences, memories, stories, and so on. Even science is showing that what we perceive is very different from the way things actually are. Cognitive science is discovering that what we perceive is never the world directly as it is, but rather our brain's best guess, like an internal stimulation. In fact, the world presented to us by perception is nothing like reality. Do you understand? In fact, uh, Hizun Dalam was quite impressed by this founder of the cognitive uh, uh, therapy. He, and Hizun Dalam quoted in the year 2005 when I was, he was teaching in Z Zurich. He quoted him saying that, the, he said, he quoted, that when we have a strong outburst of emotion like anger, this is especially in the West, no? We mask reality up to 90% by adding our prejudices and distorted views of things. So when we see things from the point of view of anger, there's 90% mental projection, mental projection, only 10% reality. By the way, his holiness is also very interested in bringing this science he started doing that in India. He wanted to start producing that in, in that kind of dialogue with the science in Asia, in many places also, you know. I think especially in the a Asia, we need to, I think, you know, it's very good, very interesting. Then a very great master, this is an amazing one. Um, the one great master said, it is very important to separate the way things appear from the way it truly are. As long as we do not do that, we will continue to think that our confused mode of perception is valid. Therefore, if you do that, we will never gain liberation from the suffering that this confusion causes us. We have to begin to see the true nature of reality is not as it superficially appears to us to be. That's why Buddhist teachings are looking into the nature of mind and also what is called on the relative level understanding of shunyata. How things are really begins to, you know, pain. One thing to have the experience of nature of mind which liberates you, but another is the study. That's why he's always all the studies about shunyata. He teaches all about shunyata. And that when you do that, you see, because one thing you have a very high understanding of nature of mind, but then you come back to, that's only momentary, but then you come back to reality, and then, you know, it doesn't support. He's only mentioned once that when he was in the late 20s and 30s, he had a very powerful experience. He read a text by Tsongkhapa Chimbo which says, I is a merely designation. When he read that, he said he had like a shock. He said like electric shock, something happened. Before he has to examine, reflect and meditate on a few minutes for him to realize the truth of that. But now he began to see it, it became real. He can still people see people, he can still see carpets, but they're without substance, without attachment. So, 
Sometimes, particularly you know, when you go through such a such a difficult uh, political and all these kind of turmoils happening, is only to cope, is to understand the ultimate nature. A refuge is in the truth. When you come to that, I was in America doing a retreat for a month, during which I was a student through this kind of study, really helped them to overcome. Then developing further, in the Buddhist teachings, the most important thing is said that mind is the root of everything. It's called in Tibetan, Kunji Jalpa, meaning mind is the universal ordering principle, is the creator of happiness and creator of suffering. Creator of what you call samsara, the world of suffering, and creator of what we call nirvana, is the mind. In fact, samsara, definition of samsara is the cycle of existence of birth and death, catalyzed by suffering, determined by harmful emotions, action, karma. In fact, the great master Shanti Deva, his demonstration of Shanti, what samsara is something like that, which I find it so moving. Though longing to be happy, in their ignorance, they destroy their happiness as if it were the worst enemy. You got that? Though longing to be happy, in their ignorance, they destroy their own happiness as if it were the worst enemy. Though they wish to get rid of suffering, yet they rush headlong towards it. It's so true. We all want to be happy. But then what happens? Because of ignorance, we just mess it all up. The longing to be happy in the ignorance. That's samsara. That's vicious. It's like the Mexican soap opera. They're very good. Like a four characters obsessing about the same thing for 20 years. <laughs> Don't you know all the movies, it's all mash-up, same stories, isn't it? Slightly different thing, again, again. And we seem to to like it. We want to watch it again because it's familiar. But anyway, so the main thing is this. Whereas nirvana literally is state beyond suffering and uh, sorrow, it can be said with the Buddha itself. The main thing is that if we are dominated by our ordinary mind, fall prey to our negative thoughts, negative emotions, then our mind is the very nightmare. And people go crazy. The mind becomes the worst enemy. Whereas if you overcome your mind, if you're able to transform, conquer your mind, and then mind is the most wonderful thing. So mind is both the creator of happiness and creator of suffering. In fact, John Milton in Paradise Lost, he said, mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell or hell of heaven. Shakespeare said also in Hamlet, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Buddha said, we are what we think. All that we are arise with the thoughts. With thoughts, we make the world. We make our own world. Speak or act with pure mind and happiness will follow. We are what we think. All that we are arise with the thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world. Speak or act the evil mind and trouble will follow. Like an ox that draws the cart. Also, Franklin Roosevelt said, men are not prisoners of fate, but only prisoners of their own minds. 
they have within themselves the power to become free at any moment. Martin Luther King said also, as long as mind is enslaved, body can never be free. You know also the example of, of Nelson Mandela. Such an example of power of mind, how he transformed, isn't it? Overcame anger and yet he, he became such an incredible force. Amazing. Sometimes, you know, learning about the life of these great beings like Gandhi, they are very, very, you know, very inspiring. And Martin Luther King said also that as long as mind is enslaved, I said that already, the body can never be free. So, don't let your mind rule you. In fact, rule your mind. In fact, there's a wonderful, I think he's only said that during a leadership conference. He said, I'm reminded of the advice given to other rulers by a king who was notably successful great governing his realm. He explained the principle of his administration or principle of his rule is, is the best way for a ruler to reign over his country is first of all to rule himself. Correct? I shared with the business leaders and it seemed to really work. When you become more practice, more friendly, changes the climate in the whole environment of your business also. So the best way for a ruler to reign over the country is first of all to rule himself. I often his own self, refer to this kind of ethical discipline as the taming of the mind. And then uh, my master German can say, Of course, I can speak all this directly, but I then wrote all these points, which are from my, many of my teachings, so that the main points are not forgotten. You got it? So you get the best. Creme de la creme. <laughs> yeah. You see, my master, uh, a disciple of his, He's still living now. He lives in Kham. And he does incredible work teaching, traveling. Even though he's slightly crippled, he does incredible work teaching. He's one of the oldest disciples, the master. His name is Parambach. His name is Parambach. So he, when he was young, he wrote a little note to my master and asking him, would you grant me some blessing? He said, Clear? <laughs> he asked him, would you grant me some blessing? Wherever my master says, you know, well, it would be difficult for someone like me to confer blessing. Because it happened also to Joji Padne this great master, you know. He, a disciple his, uh, is a very cozy one, you know. He kind of came to Joji, bent very low to Joji Padne, and she said, Oh, Joji, would you grant me some blessing? He bent very low. Whereupon the amazing thing, the response was, Joji Padnadisha bent even lower than him and said, would you grant me some devotion? When he said, would you grant me some blessings? Joji bent even lower, would you grant me some devotions? Because if there's no devotion, there's no blessing. If you have devotion, actually blessing is yours already. It's not like you have devotion and blessing comes, you know, next time by mail. Or rather, it, it immediately. In fact, to have a devotion is indeed the grace and blessing. So what my master was saying to him that, you know, while it be difficult for someone like me to confer blessing, 
upon you. But if you generate pure perception and devotion in your heart and mind, then blessing will surely be yours. Of this, there can be no doubt whatsoever. Why is this? Why? Because aside from the pure and impure perception in your mind, there's no one who can bind you or change you or set you free. If your mind is impure, you're in samsara, chained. If your mind is pure, you're liberated. I find this so amazing. Aside from the pure and impure state of mind, there's no one can bind you or set you free. We are our own master. So we should be, our mind should be free. That's why the main advice I've written in the Tibetan Book of Living Time, or the, at the moment of death, what's the most important thing? At the moment of death, let go of attachment aversion. Because it doesn't work. Keep your heart and mind pure. Most of them keep your heart and mind pure. And unite your mind with the wisdom mind of Buddhas. And rest in the nature of mind. So keeping your heart and mind pure, when we realize that the mind is the root of everything, it brings us great hope because basically we realize that, you know, it's up to us. Happiness is up to us. Suffering is up, it's up to us. In fact, I remember one student of mine who was always not happy. Always. Nothing could bring him happiness. And so, he was absolutely fed up. So one day he came to me saying, I'm fed up. What I'm going to do is now, whether I'm happy or not, I'm going to be happy. <laughs> he made a mind and he became happy. It doesn't really matter, but attitude. In fact, a student of mine, or rather, he is the father of a, well, the husband of a student of mine, and he himself went through the cancer twice and is just now in really remission and good health. He, when we ask what is the secret of his cure, he said, Tibetan Book of Living Dead. He read, he's not a student of mine, he came to my talk once, but he read the Tibetan Book of Living Dead again and again. And the book is all tattered, you know, all notes and reading again like a Bible. Again and again reading that. That and then positivity and good attitude. That's why many people, you know, in fact, the, there are many, many who read my book and who follows like the, you know, their teacher, like a living teacher, having never met me, never contacted me. Because I wrote the book in a way, in the first person, and really fell in the West, there's no culture of following a teacher. So really the only thing way is to bring the teaching in such a way that the book itself becomes a living master. In fact, once someone came to me in Philadelphia after I'd written the book, a few years after I was giving a talk, he said, this person came to say to me, I don't know how you did it, but the book loved me completely. I was very touched. This person knew because it's all about love. The incredible love of the Buddhas and Masters. Their compassion. Often when I see that, just like I'm in tears, you know. Such compassion, love, that's for us. We are lovable and we are loved. Love is constantly, we can access that love through practice. Buddha said, if you go all over the world, someone more worthy of your love than you, you will not find another. He who loves himself or herself will not harm another. Because often people who do not love themselves, they are the ones who harm others. Love is the most important thing. 